What a career this guy's had. There's a lot that I need to ask old Ernie, and, and let's get this show started. Let's get it started. Dirty mode. Dirty mode. Dirty mode. Dirty mode. Dirty mode. All right, so uh, this past weekend, Darlington uh, really was a great race. Great race weekend. A lot of great racing all the way across the board. Trucks, Xfinity, Cup, and uh, had a lot of fun in the booth. Colin, some, uh, some, some great action there, but also got to work with Del Jarrett and Kyle Petty for uh, Stage 2. I uh, kind of got to get the host in that moment. A lot of fun. A little bit awkward, uh, but you get more and more comfortable as it goes, and uh, which is good. I'm glad I got to do that because I get to host the Xfinity race for Richmond as well. So uh, sat- I think Saturday morning. Xfinity race is in the afternoon. The cup race is in the evening on Saturday the 12th. And I'll be hosting that. So that's the Red Sox are coming off a win in their previous that's game. That's what they call it. Yeah. Hi again, everybody. So, I'm Dwayne Kuyper. Yeah. Welcome well, to tonight's heard, game. Uh, With me, as always, former 20-game winner Mike Kruko. Thanks, Kuyper. Uh, Looks like another play great play night for baseball. Of yours. Thank you. Tonight's early game features about, the Colorado Rockies like and the Boston Red Sox. 500 miles. Did you say that at some point? Yeah. I just said 500 miles feels like forever. Yeah. Yeah, that one did take a long time. But maybe it was because we were just so used to all the short races. I'll be honest. I was, uh, so I saw the, I don't, I'm, I don't, I'm not assuming that my comment 500 miles here feels like forever. I'm not assuming that my comment started the conversation that I saw on Twitter, but I did see a conversation mm-hmm. on Twitter about the length of the race and, and most people saying, don't touch it. Right. I love it. I guess if there's any question, the I don't think that the race Forecast is too long. Is for right. the to be <laughs> Just a, I don't think it's too long. It does feel like forever, and I'm perfectly fine with that. Yeah. I don't want Into it to feel right shorter not, than it is. You're not trying to start a movement to no. shorten the no. no. distance. <laughs> Some things are good that take long. Nothing, nothing, there was nothing wrong or false about my car. Right. But I don't want that stay the same length. Anyhow, No, I mean, you're the play-by-play guy. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> You're play-by-play all the time here. <laughs> Lead us well, down. I really, you know, I had a lot of fun. Uh, and, 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 and and we had the 77 car yeah. throwback, Dale Earnhardt 1976 we'll throwback. 30 mode media on the side. Um, and I didn't even know that you went to the race, Mike. So you sent me some pictures of you sitting in the grandstands the right watching the race. Um, and you just seem to be just so happy to be back at the racetrack. And I, was, I, I miss being at the track. I cannot yeah. wait till we can go back and work in the booth again and call the race live. Um, but what was, what was it like? You said it was pretty profound. It was, it was, it was incredible to be back. I, you know, I couldn't go inside because that's the rules, you know, but I, I, I could be on the outside. And just being back in a racetrack in a, in a live event was amazing. I also, I left with a changed worldview about racing because I spent that entire race not watching the lead pack, but watching where our car was, right? And in, in our car, the Spire Motorsports was, you know, towards the back. That's where they are. That's where they started. It's where they knew they would be racing. Uh, and yet... I didn't feel like I thought this I had a, a good chance. a good uh, uh, grasp on the totality of a race, but it's until caught. you actually live life what as a backmarker, quote grab. unquote backmarker, I don't know that you got the full co- concepts of racing. And I know you guys have it a lot better than I do, just because of growing up in racing. But like for instance, you know, negotiating for people's tires, Misses trying to get ball. scuffs. Trying to get whatever kind of hand-me-down stuff that you can get from a from a team, you're forming alliances. This happened in during the race, right? Well, because I was, you know, I sat there with Joey Denowitz, and, and obviously, is, uh, Joey is the well, he play, he serves the role as the competition director for Spire Motorsports, but he is also who I uh, worked with in in the sponsorship to begin with, and so he works for Jeff Dickerson, and and really is plugged in into kind of the, the strategy and the development of the race team. So, so hear me out on this one. I am. What if it's I told you that in short. that race, the very race that y'all watched on television and, and that you broadcast, this hour. race, Ross made a last lap, last Cabrera corner pass down. for a position that mattered a, a, a great that deal to him. So much so that Ross comes on the radio the after he takes the checkered driving. flag and it was like, wow, my heart was racing more in that than it was yesterday in the Xfinity race, which as you recall, he was yep. hunting for the win in that before he got into that little accident. And so here it is, 
he's reacting as if he won the race. All he won was 29th place. Well, why is that? And that is because there were only two other cars on that racetrack as far as they were concerned. They go into that race with their own race. They are racing the 27 of J.J. Yaley, and they are racing the 15 of, is it Brendan Poole? I believe the driver, Brendan Poole? And those are the two drivers that they are racing. That's 32nd, 33rd, and 34th in points. The difference between those two positions in the season ending in the payout hole. is roughly $200,000. $200,000 is what they are racing for against those guys. So they're playing this cat and mouse game this whole race. Now this is just, I'm, I'm, I'm living life uh, in a completely different scenario for, for this race. So the feeling was the 77, we've we got to beat those two cars. We feel like we can out-tire them, is what Joey said. We feel like we can out-tire them. And I said, well, what do you mean? You like, well, because of our sponsorship in large part, because of our sponsorship, you know, they were able to get a full boat of tires, which would be what, eight or, ni eight or nine sets, the right? They didn't feel like the other two, One, two three, could do the that. They over. thought that they all they had Heading was scuffs for stage the three. No and I said, well, here. how do you know? Well, we just, because this is what, this is the life we live every week, it's week to week. I said, well, how do you know if they're gonna, if we're gonna out tire them, how are you keeping that news from them? I said, do you got all our tires set up? No. I said, well, where we only got three sets set out. This is to start the race. I said, where are you hiding the other sets of tires? And he goes, we'll buy them during the race. We'll buy them during the race. I said, shut up. He goes, yeah, we're not gonna buy them until we need them. So as it played out, Stage three setup. All you're trying to do is stay. If you, you, you know you're gonna get lapped, just don't get lapped, and not them other two guys. Uh, you know, they, like it, it's better if everybody gets lapped or whatever. And so that's the way it sort of played out. Now Brendan Poole got lucky just in, in stage three with the uh, leader was about to put him a lap down, and the caution came out. He was able to stay a lap ahead of the other two cats. So then it became a, a race between Ross. And JJ Yale. And they are fighting for 30, they're fighting in 31st and 30th place. And I'm telling you what, man, that race was incredible. Ross puts on his new tires. This was the strategy. We're going to out tire him. JJ is a second slower, but he takes the wave around. And so when they go restart the, like, the last 30 or 40 laps, he's got a huge amount of ground to catch to catch Yaley. He catches him on the white flag lap going through all this traffic and then passes him coming off of four and and gets a nose and momentum out because he took high line got the momentum took the checkered flag and i swear to god you'd have thought that we'd won the dang race and it was for 29 and it was just it was i was intrigued by the rate there is a race going on that tv does it capture and can't capture by the way in fact Without all the context that I just gave you, I don't know how you can sit in the grandstands and really be able to identify these little micro races that are going on, but they're super important. And you know, Peter Suspenzo, who's like the, act, the, you know, the oldest active winning crew chief in the, in the sport, is right there, uh, you know, uh, you know executing this thought out strategy that, that all had to do with tires. Now I said, next here, week when y'all go to Richmond, too. could they be out tiring us? I mean, he's like, yeah, it's a week to week thing. And so, it really gave me an appreciation for a, a lot of these teams. And, and I think that a fair question would be, well, why did they do this? Like, you know, like, why does Rick Ware racing, what's in it for them? And I think that the answer to that is that uh, it's like everything in life, it's all relative, right? It makes sense for them because they're not spending what these other cats are spending, like Childress and Hendrick. They're spending what's within their means. And if they get the, you know, one additional position and points that's probably the difference of a hundred thousand dollars right there and then that's going to be bonus the other thing i thought was compelling is that they budget their race team now think about this you know how we always know what the winner's purse is they budget based off of what last place finishes and they assume that they're going to finish last place so that way anything they get beyond that you know in front of that it's just bonus man that's just more money they can put to the race team next week it, that, that is just a, listen been fortunate enough i've been in the sport for 19 years been with you for 17 dale um and you know we we 
we live a blessed life. <laughs> but but I, I really appreciated what Spire Motorsports. Also, Peter Suspenzo and Ross gave you a shout out in the uh, on, on the uh, pace yeah, lap again. One, two, yeah, just they said uh, we want to thank Dale Jr. and Dirty Mo Media for being on board with us. Yeah. I know, right? So yeah. did you get a, the, the stripe? I don't know. Now he kept it clean. That was another thing they said. Score you know one, what makes Ross so different than than a lot of the other drivers the that even may race their cars that he races so well in traffic and i said what do you mean by that he goes well when he gets lapped he doesn't lose time and a lot of drivers lose time when they're getting lapped but but they like him because he knows how to race in traffic without losing a bunch of time because in their race it matters right and uh, he, he put on a well of a show and on uh, saturday too so well i you know i, so I got a, a lot of respect for him he he was uh he was up on the wheel even this race yeah. but also included having to keep the car clean yeah, I've been wanting to get uh, Timmy Hill on our uh, podcast to, to have to, exactly to have this same right conversation there. that you just experienced in the. Uh, so Timmy Hill run, runs his own truck, and I've wanted him to come on here and explain to us how he does it. Right, and look, talking about little things like budgeting for last place. Right, just what does Timmy do to, to survive with his truck? Uh, he just finished in the top ten for the first time this season at Darlington with his very own. My mom and pop's truck team. Yep. I, I, I want to know more. Yeah. So, um, and I also think um, we're going to talk to uh, Ernie Irvin here in a moment. He's going to give us a lot of more, a, lot of, a few other guests, future guests. And he makes the play the at the wall. Yeah. 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 I, mean, I, I really appreciate it. It was fun. Did y'all have fun, you know, having a Dirty Mo Media car out there? Dude, are you kidding me? It was good. It looked good. It was a good looking race car. We wore the shirts at the house, and we were just like, it was If anything, for the shirts. I mean, I'm so. Hell yeah. I'm so happy to have the shirt. They were good shirts. Did you Joe see Matt. any shirts out there? Uh, no, well, they weren't out there. Uh, oh, yeah. So Joe didn't put them. Uh, they couldn't get them. Yeah, couldn't get them there. To customers. Right. Well, hopefully uh, we'll start seeing much. some of them shirts at the racetrack. Yeah, that'd be cool. It's a good shirt. All right. A little bit of news today. Big news. There's a strike NASCAR with the announcing that California Speedway or Auto Club Speedway will be engaging in an aggressive plan pitch. to redevelop the racetrack into oh, a half-mile high-bank track bases. that will produce fast and exciting short track racing. Mm. Yes. Wow. Hashtag more short tracks. Yeah. Yes. It will create a unique one-of-a-kind racing experience for fans and for commitment to the region. So, I look. All right, if this Base is true, I'm down. We're going to lose a pretty awesome racetrack. California, the multiple grooves, running the fence. It's just such an amazing place. Uh, but, yeah, the West Coast needs a little taste of Bristol, needs a little taste of short track racing. And if this is what we're going to send out there, it's really going to strengthen our sport. Maybe in the years to come, more importantly, probably in the next decade, two decades, having, uh, having some of that action for the fans out there is going to do so much for our sport on a national level. I've felt that way for a really, really long time. So, it's awesome news. The uh, catch is made. Yeah. And it's a new short track. We're going to have new yeah. short track. Man. Is this the beginning? Remember the boom of the mile and a half where everybody wanted to build one all over the country? Yeah. Are we getting ready to see a land rush of short yes. tracks into the NASCAR Cup State? We're in that business. <laughs> Marcus, you, you're set, you're beaming Make right now. Sure. I, don't <laughs> I don't think you beamed like this on your wedding day. I don't think you beamed like this when I was born. I'm Look excited about this. But this man, is cool. If there's like ten more coming behind it, yes. I'm I'm very excited right now. Holy crap! Are you hungry? Get fresh, pre-measured ingredients and mouth-watering seasonal recipes delivered right to your door. Hello, fresh. America's number one milk kit. And this stuff is good. I got mine delivered. It says Hello Fresh for a reason. And it was fresh. The ingredients were high quality. And it was easy to pick the meals. And they had a lot to choose from. The, the directions made it so simple. And the meals were absolutely delicious. I'm going to pronounce this wrong. But I had the beef bulgogi. Bulgogi. Bowl. Bowl. Beef bulgogi bowl. Beef bulagi bowl. Beef bologna? Beef bologna? 
Is there a chance he's pronouncing it? In the hole. A thousand percent. <laughs> B-U-L. Have a left hander getting Everybody ready in the here. pen. B-U-L. B-U-L. Write it down. Oh, Leah's got it. Beef Bulgogi Bowl. <laughs> Bulgogi? B-U-L-G-O-G-I. A Bulgogi Bowl. B-U-L-G-O-G-I. Oh, he's not kidding. It's a thing. not wrong. It is a thing. It's a thing. Bulgogi. Literally fire meat. Fire meat? That's what it says. I like meat and I love fire. I love bulgogi. Bulgogi. What's so funny? If I would have said I like meat, then it would be in the jingle next week of the show, would it not? You know, it'd be like the intro and it's like, I like meat and I like bulgogi. How do you pronounce it, Leah? It's Does a it bulgogi bowl because it has bulgogi sauce, a savory concoction that combines soy sauce and sesame After with a little bit of innings, sweet. The score is four to nothing. Okay. Uh, prep time was five minutes. We got a uh, we got a pronunciation. Bulgogi. Bulgogi. No. Gow. Gow. Seven hundred eighty calories. <laughs> uh, jasmine rice, white vinegar, white wine vinegar, shredded carrots, bulgogi sauce, <laughs> sriracha. Sour cream, ground beef, cucumber, scallions, all this, and tossed into a bowl. It was freaking great. Really? Yes. I was really happy. With HelloFresh, you save time, money, and stress. The recipes they include have simple steps and pictures to guide you along the way. It's like this big play card. It basically spells it out for you. HelloFresh cuts out the stressful meal planning and grocery store trips so you can enjoy cooking and Get dinner on the table in about 30 minutes or less. You can save 40% by using HelloFresh versus shopping at your local grocery store. And it's more convenient. Gourmet recipes like the balsamic fig syrup are over 60% cheaper than an average meal out. HelloFresh offers so many delicious options every week to help you break out of your recipe rut and try new things. There's something for everyone, That's including low-calorie, vegetarian, and kid-friendly recipes. Over 90% Parker, of the ingredients are sourced the directly from growers to ensure the freshest over. recipes, and they're delivered right to your door. Keep play. that Crooked fridge stocked by best. adding extra protein After or sides half, like garlic bread to your weekly order. Four. The flexibility allows you to easily change your delivery days, food preferences, and even skip a week if you've got something going on or heading out of town, whatever. Feeding the whole family is a cinch with larger box sizes for more servings and more savings. Go to HelloFresh.com slash DaleJr80 and use the code DaleJr80 to get a total of $80 off your first month. That's a lot. Including free shipping on your first box. Additional restrictions apply. Please visit HelloFresh.com for more details. Again, $80 off your first month and free shipping on your first box by going to HelloFresh.com slash DaleJr80 and use that promo code DaleJr80. All right, we got the guests, so let's uh, let's bring them in. Ernie Irvin. All right. Let's get to Ernie. And the 1991 winner of the Daytona 500 is Ernie Irvin. Is Ernie Irvin. Is Ernie Irvin. The next batter. But I'm, damn, I'm getting tired of getting swept up in all this accident. I don't want to get hurt driving one of these race cars any more than anybody else does, and this looks like the kind of guy that can hurt you. I said, I'll tell you the same thing I told Earnhardt. I said, we'll race each other. You hit me, I'm going to crash it. And I've never had any problem with Irvin. I haven't had any problem with Earnhardt. And if they ever touch me, I'm going to wipe them out. I'm going to wipe them out. I'm going to wipe them out. Saturday morning practices are usually quiet, but Saturday, August 20th, was tragically different. Point contender Ernie Irvin experienced a horrible crash. Fractured skull, swollen brain, as well as collapsed lungs. Ernie Irvin for the checkered flag, and it's won the Mexican 400. This track nearly took your life. Today, you took something back from it, a big win. All right, guest on the show today, pretty incredible guy, Ernie Irvin. Thanks for coming out on the show, man. We're so glad to have you here. Yeah, I mean, I've been looking forward to uh, uh, coming on the show. What you been up to, buddy? Uh, just um, Jared racing a little bit and just 
you know, you doing work cool. around the farm all the time and trying to work out some. So where do you live? I live in Ocala, Florida. Okay. Did y'all have a, an equestrian club in near Charleston, South Carolina at one point? Did I read that correctly? Yeah, we uh, we built a farm um, down in um, like south of Charleston. Yeah. Um, did all that and decided we didn't like it after that. So it wasn't real smart, but we did and we sold it and and then we uh, moved back to Concord. Um, we lived there for another the two or three years. Me and my wife told me that she was moving like to um, Ocala, Florida, and if I I hope uh, you want to join me, so uh, I I joined her right here. <laughs> What's in Ocala? What what took you there? Um, there's horses, and my wife loves the, the property area, and um, it, it's it's really beautiful and. So um, that's they what uh, the third took us here. Umpire. What was it about Concord that's that was, uh, I got to get back to Ocala? I mean, Concord may have a horse or two, right? Oh, yeah, they do. And I mean, we had a horse farm up there. And uh, she just um, wanted wanted a, a change, and I did too. And yeah. um, it was um, interesting in Ocala every time we come here to visit, like with the horse show and stuff. We really enjoyed it because it's so beautiful. Where were you born and raised? I was born in Salinas, California. Actually, born in Carmel, um, but I actually was raised in Salinas. But how did you get all the way over to the North Carolina? My mom and my dad kind of separated, and and then we finally found out where Dad was at, and he said, Dad said that um, he said, man, if you ever want to do anything in racing, you've got to be here in um, North Carolina. And so I kind of followed what he said. Was there really a time where you didn't know where your daddy went? Oh, yeah, there was probably pitch inside. two Sometimes years, three years. Yeah, how old were you? Exactly you? How old were you? I mean, uh, I think I was um, 18. Were you mad when you finally oh, found out where he was at? Would you go, He's hey, Dad, what's up? <laughs> Why are you hiding from him? 16 <laughs> home runs. No, I mean, I really wasn't mad. It was, um, it was just one of the things Brown that, to the you third know, base Dad though. felt like he needed to leave California because of, He's you know, all the situation. And, you know, what mom felt like right she wanted to stay you there. For, and it ended up and that um, then when we finally found out where dad was at, then uh, he was like, I mean, I followed what he was saying. You know, if you ever want to do anything further in racing, you need to be on the East Coast. Was he a racer to begin with? Yeah, dad um, raced on um, dirt tracks most of the time. And, um, I grew base. up basically around the the dirt tracks and watching him. Okay, so he, he must have, you know, with the situation at home, being what it was, he left, needed a new beginning, but he also was continuing to pursue the racing. Is that correct? He's got yeah, Dad, Dad was actually working with Lake Speed, and you know, we all know Lake. Um, and so he, he kept trying to not race himself, and he started promoting some race race tracks right here. Um, well, actually, uh, up in North Carolina, Concord. Um, and it used to be the Concord Speedway, yeah. um, not the new Concord Speedway. So he um, started promoting there, and then it kind of closed down, and, and so he was kind of like um, lost, and you know didn't didn't have a whole lot of racing except for Takes some uh, Cup stuff with Lake Speed. Was he the last promoter for the old Concord? I think so. Wow. Um, I'm, I'm not 100 percent positive because I went here though. Yeah, that's pretty cool because that place I never went to that track. I don't believe I might have. Maybe went when I was too young to remember, but because uh, there's two Concord Speedway, there's right. an old uh, oval that would become a development, a housing development, and then they built the next one out on 601, and it just recently closed yeah. a couple years ago. But so you started racing though out in California. When did you run your first race? Uh, I was uh, 16. Dang, you started kind of late. I mean, kids these days are racing at three, four, five years old. Well, I, w- I started. I started in go karts. Yeah. And- you know, basically, I started when I was eight years old, and um, you know, ran ran a lot of go kart stuff, and you know, actually um, won the, the state title sometime. In, um, I think in the uh, late '80s, um, and just um, really enjoyed it. Went to the nationals a couple of times. Um, I, I look at the nationals, um, the people that were there, and the people that were there is Lake Speed um, and uh, the Pruitts. You know, they were both there, and so it, it was interesting. People that, that I know here now uh, in the, this time of the world. Yeah, recognizable names. Slick Speed, we, we talk about him a little bit. 
as being one of the. Uh, I mean, he was the world. He was like the world champ. He beat Sen who, who did he beat? Senna. He went he to what? Second. Yeah. Yeah, he went overseas and oh, er, beat Senna in the world championship. Is that right, Matthew? The fell I don't know. Forgot all about him. <laughs> you stumped me. Yeah, I think so. He's a world karting champion, like yeah. speed. I knew that, but yeah. um, beating Senna. So you move. So Which all right, what, right, when you when you move Drew, to you North no Carolina, problem. what are you giving Next up? What are you leaving in California? I really left um, the I, my mom because she didn't leave at that moment, um, and basically it was nothing else. No racing, no cars. No, I mean my racing deal. Um, I actually drove for Jack McCoy, um, oh, yeah. and. With the Winston West, yeah. we, we did about uh, six or seven races, and um, then we were uh, pretty much Jack. Jack decided he didn't want to spend any more money. I read a book about Jack McCoy. How did that go? So I know who Jack is. Uh, how did how did your races with him go? Well, I mean, I mean, we never really won with Jack, and um, I mean, I think we struggled a little bit because we didn't know a whole lot. Um, but that's when I met, um, before that I met Ivan Baldwin and he was working for Jack. And then another name that we all know is uh, Gary Nelson. Um, that was um, the first people that built my stock car was Gary Nelson and Ivan Baldwin. So, I mean, I, I had a, a really good um, people to follow and be able to help me. So you move over to North Carolina, and what what did you when you got to Carolina? What was there for you? What what was did you have a job lined up? What was the deal? No, I didn't have no job lined up. It was <laughs> just uh, just basically just Dad said you need to be in North Carolina, and so I, I I basically chased my dream about racing. It really wasn't about the Cup Series because I didn't know much about that, and it was kind of like way beyond way beyond. I was probably gonna reach and so I never really paid attention to it much but we love dirt racing and we did, we did that uh, me and Mark Reno um, and Mark, Re Mark Reno you know him man um, I, mean, we, I mean Mark was a great guy he's the one that really started me off in in the Carolinas did you what, you had to you had to get a job so what was like your first responsibility yeah, working at Charlotte Motor Speedway welding seats no Mahomes kidding. Welding in, the grand, grand, welding in grandstand seats. Well, yeah, they were they were all portable, basically. They, oh, you you, you could take them, unbolt them, and move them. Um, and I worked with, uh, I think it was Jimmy G. Which you, yeah, you know, Uncle Jimmy G. Um, yeah, yeah, we worked with him. He was he was right there, and then uh, Robbie was there. Um, and so, so I kind of got to meet them guys, and the count it was it was interesting. But they paid by the seat, and so basically, <laughs> he takes the yeah. So the I would kind of try to get there early before they Looking got there. They weren't the getting out. up real early, and there, there was times that the I would get there like six in the morning, so I could really put out some seats honest, right before they got the there. <laughs> um, so it, it was easier for me at that time, and um, it wasn't easy to get up at six, but. Um, it was it was easy to try to make a little money. Did you know this about your uncle? Like Jimmy G's out welding seats at Speedway with Ernie Irvin? I, like who knew that? I mean, that, how random is that? Didn't see that one. That one comes. Everybody knew everybody. Right? But um, so you welded seats for a while. I heard that you were a really really great fabricator, and 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 something in my mind wants to think that you worked as a fabricator in you know for certain teams building cars, helping people build cars. How did you meet Mark Reno? And let's let's help people understand who Mark is. Well, so how did you meet Mark Reno, and what can you explain Mark to the to the listeners? Well, when I was on the West Coast um, with Ivan Baldwin. Uh, we built some of uh, uh, stuff that Mark Reno uh, and yeah, actually like Trek racing tool. That's a, that was one thing on the West Coast, and so I um, helped build some of uh, Mark's cars. I'm not the real big fabricator. Mark yeah. is the fabricator. Yeah. Um, so, so I mean, he he started, um, the and then he actually uh, he had the Trick Trick program and. Ron Esau drove for him a bunch, and yeah, uh, some other people. Up, uh, Joe right. Rutman drove for him some. And then, uh, then when I moved to the East Coast, Mark had already moved to the East Coast and was actually working for Mark Martin. So, uh, in and when Mark Martin closed his program down, 
at the moment. And then Mark was there, and so I knew him already. And so we kind of just got together. And I went down there, and we had odd jobs. One of the odd jobs was we were filming some stuff for your dad, um, Del Sr. And so, it, you know, some of the hunting stuff, because he was real big on hunting. And so we, we built some of the stands. It was more Mark doing it. Um, he knew how to do it. He told me, weld this together, weld that together, and so I did. How many times did you, how many times in your life do you think you flash burn your face here? Stepping in, welding. Well, yeah, especially because most of the time you didn't weld a helmet, wear a helmet. So, um, well, you just close, you just close your eyes. You know? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> that doesn't right. That does not work, because I try, I've been, I've done the same thing. I, I want to add one thing. You know, Mark Reno is somebody that's fascinating, and he comes up a good bit on this show, because his life has intersected with a lot of people and and he, by the way he watches this show a good bit because we have people on here that on he worked with yeah. this will be another yep. uh, case but reno was also the crew chief the, the first year i was in racing he was the crew chief because uh, i was working on finch's team now he got with finch is the next years 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 earlier than that but uh, the, the the influence he's had in this sport he, he's such a humble guy you will never hear him talk about himself he's one of those guys that just you know you hardly get him to talk but when you get him wound up, he'll go. So Mark Reno, influential. Fuchsia. This is the person that you first connected with, basically, that got you involved in racing. Well, I'm mean, involved in racing on the East Coast. On the East Coast. I mean, I, I actually was racing with, with um, Dad, my father. To the left um, side. And, and we were doing some, but not a whole That's lot. And actually, you know, one of the people you all know is um, Tom Pistone. Um, we, me and Mark both worked over at Tom Pistone building some of the cars and, a roller and out so we <laughs> so i mean all these things that are inner circled and um, it was inter interesting time yeah. so you got to race in late models at concord speedway the new concord speedway okay the big 10 series tell me how you how how do you get back in the driver's seat what op, what, what opportunity created your chance to go back to driving and racing well um you know obviously i did some with my dad and then right then Mark, Mark said, he said, we're going to build a, uh, a pavement car, but we're going to run it on the dirt. And so we did. Um, I was, you know, definitely a part of it, trying it to help him, but he was the, the brains and money behind it. And so we built this car and we decided to, to go run. And um, we actually were pretty dominant a lot of times Ryan at Concord in the, in the dirt, but only when it dry slick. Um, when, it, when it was zero. wet. Yeah, when That's it was wet, I was, I was good done. Executor. So that car uh, was a white car, black nose, number five, right? Yep. You know why I know that? I was There's at uh, the I was at North Wilkesboro Speedway, and uh, you were running one of your first few cup races. I think you might have been racing for DK or somebody, but you had only raced uh, literally just a handful of cup races and just starting to get your feet wet. And you gave me and a tenth comes scale That's an RBI RC novel. car that you ran over somewhere at some run. RC track in town fun. with that body. It has a dirt wedge body on it, painted up just yeah. like that late model car that you raced. Right and it was a four-wheel drive electric RC car. You gave me the car exactly and the radio the right there in the driver's owner, sort of where everybody parked their buses. Okay. Not buses, but everybody parked their vans. You know, everybody that, and uh, we kind of hardly, we kind of barely knew each other. But for some yep. reason, you gave me that car, and I thought that I was like, Going into the I was with Brad six, Means, Jimmy Means' son. And I said, yeah, I got it. Yeah, I said I got to meet Ernie Irvin. He's giving me some RC car, and Brad was like, "What?" And I was like, <laughs> just listen, just wait. We're supposed to meet him right here. And he came by the driver's lounge and ran over to your car, grabbed it, handed it to me. Jackson and Brad Means is standing there with his ball. jaw on the ground. And I was yeah. like, "Check this damn RC car out! He's giving me this thing's amazing." <laughs> Do you remember this, Ernie? Uh, vaguely. Um, I mean. One of the things that I was always um, um, mad about that I, I don't remember some meeting Dell Jr. So um, I knew that he was around because a lot of the things I see, you know, is is part of what Dell Jr. was doing. So, base. Um, I just thought I was interested, um, you know, and then uh, when, um, somebody come up and wanted you know, my autograph or, or something and I had that 
I really didn't need any more. I was not running my RC car. Um, so, so I said, hey, you know, Dale Jr., I'll, I'll give him that, that car. And, yeah. That's amazing. Um, you know, you know, let him mess with it. Sometimes you try well, we did, dude. I played with that car, used it a lot, and had a good time with it. And I, I obviously never forgot Sometimes that. But you, you, you run your first cup race exactly what you saw right there. in yep. 1987 at Richmond with yep. Mark Reno. You and him built the car. Right. I See, I thought that your first cup race was at Charlotte in the 600 in that Three, silver 56. Uh, Dale Hart Chevrolet sponsored car, and you ran 12th, I believe, in that race. God, 600 miles was a long, long, long way that day. But you it's ran your first race first. at Richmond in '87, Mark. So, how do you hit. remember? Like, man, are you? You know, you said it just a minute ago. You're not, you're not looking at Cup as an opportunity. You're not looking toward Cup because it seemed like such an unattainable goal. But here you are, racing, gonna, gonna run your first Cup race. Were you guys, Pat, what was your emotions? Were you freaking out? Were you thrilled? Were you scared to death? Well, at, at that time, I was pretty cocky, which um, I really didn't, didn't have any reason to be, but um, I just felt like it's like, okay, well, you know, Mark had the car. I helped build it, you know, basically. It was an old, old car that somebody had ran um, out on the, I think on the West Coast, and so, Mark ended up getting it. I think it was had been burnt, um, so we kind of rebuilt it, uh, brought it back to life, and um, that was I think that was the first race car that we had. And um, and Mark decided he says he said you know you know we have the dirt car and then we went to the pavement car. Um, let's let's do a car. And, and I was kind of all for it. I mean obviously because Mark was going to own it and drive and have me drive it, and so it was. Um, it was definitely um, an exciting time. We went to Richmond and made the race and ended up blowing up. Um, and so we we didn't really finish very well, but our, our next race was at Charlotte Motor Speedway. And that was the um, October race. Yeah. So it, it was only a 500 mile race. Okay. That's, that's why I can last that long. Um, <laughs> now, was it the same car? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah it's the same car, yeah. because. And, and you know what was funny? I mean, you kind of know a little bit more about chassis stuff now. Um, uh, it was a, we had a Watts link on it. And a lot of people don't know what a Watts link is, but um, we had a Watts link on it, and nobody ran that. No. Um, I mean, there was no cup cars with that. And so, but Mark was, Mark was very inventive. And so he decided, he said, yeah, this will, we'll, we'll run this car. And we went to Charlotte and ended up um, making the race. and. Um, that was one of the things we were worried about. Um, we were all, Mark was really worried about paying for tires, but he said, you know, we're, we're doing it. We're, we're going, I don't know how we're going to pay for tires, but we're going to do it. And so we did that, and a lot of the teams, when they ran out of tires, God, not ran out, but when they, they broke, we could um, get some of their tires or some tires that they took off, and we would put them on. And we ended up finishing um, eighth that day. Oh, so, yeah, it's top um, ten. Yeah. How does it end Next up at Dale Earnhardt Paint Scheme or a, a, a sponsorship? Well, you talk about the relationship. Uh, Dad knew Ernie it's and obviously was great friends with Mark Reno. And Ernie, and Ernie you know, met Dad through building some of the hunting stands and so forth. So I imagine when Mark went, you know, when, Mark, when Dad learned of – Ernie driving in this race with Mark's car. I assume that I'm just, you can fill me in here, Ernie, but I'm assuming dad just reached out and said, hey, I want to put the Chevrolet store on there. I don't see you in retirement. Is it something like that? It, it was something like that, but the only, the only reason that it all happened was because of Mark Reno and your late his, his senior and ended up that I'm um, senior and uh, Kenny Schrader were driving to um, I think Darlington, and that that race was going on, and so Schrader said, "Hey, um, he he come in and seen the car. He said, well, what are you guys going to do with this?" I said, "Well, Ernie's going to drive it at Richmond, and then also we're going to try to go to Charlotte, and so we ended up um, with the Dale Earnhardt Chevrolet um, on the side because um, Kenny Schrader kind of kind of." Um, I don't know if he kind of tricked your dad doing it or what, <laughs> but you you know Schrader really well. Sure. So 
Um, yeah, he's he's, he's one of them the that you know he can he can BS and the best. The and, um, so um, he's the one that kind of got the whole thing going, and and it was also because you know Dell Senior, obviously Rockies, your dad knew Mark new pitcher, uh, Reno, and so they they were doing it a lot because of Mark, and I think your dad had heard about me on the um, in Concord and. I didn't have a real good reputation, but I had a good reputation as winning. Yeah. You talked about it. So you, you were cocky. Um, you had a reputation <laughs> for being aggressive, uh, but you won a lot. Uh, and you carried that reputation and attitude oh. on into the Jason Cup Series. You went and raced for DK Ulrich. Uh, yeah. You drove this white number two really car with Kroger sponsorship. And you, this is, to me, obviously finishing eighth in that in the Dale Earnhardt Chevrolet comes. Monte Carlo at Charlotte was amazing. Yeah. It was a close pitch. Uh, but well, the moment that I think I remember seeing you flash the brilliance and, and, and um, potential in your cup career was at Bristol the runner goes. in DK's car. Yep. You guys had done something this uh, with your pit strategy and some tires and that got yourself up for the front and you literally uh, – in a car, DK's cars didn't run at the front. You know, DK's cars typically ran in the very back end. When you started driving them, they got better. They got, they ran better. They ran faster. They ran, they ran, you know, 10, 15 spots better. But then at Bristol that day, uh, you're leading the race in this car that doesn't lead. This car does not lead races. And you were out front. You ended up getting out, getting into the fence off the four. But that to me was the moment when I thought, oh man. He's gonna get snatched up. Mm. Some team's gonna get him. And he's gonna be, because you know I'm a Dale Earnhardt fan at this time. A little kid, Dale Earnhardt fan. I don't like people. I don't like people coming in, in and I don't like dad. I don't like the the competition getting tougher. Mm. I want dad to win every race. I want him to laugh the field every week. And I'm like, oh man, this guy's he's gonna be Ernie's gonna be up there, gonna be beat, beat, beat dad for races. We're gonna have to, we're gonna have a team with this one. Yes. <laughs> and do you remember that race? Because I will never forget it. Yeah, I could use a bit of a break. Uh, see it. I will also. So I was Ernie. I was a big Jimmy Means fan. You might, you might, yeah. remember, you might remember that. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. So when I saw yeah, those cars this game's run well, it was like you were almost like an underdog, you know. And DK was certainly an underdog. And there you are out front leading this race running really well at Bristol was that did you know what you were doing in that moment um like leading yeah, <laughs> yeah did you so, know did you so, was yeah. it like could you believe it or yeah, were you like it's it's what I do I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm right where I'm supposed to yeah. be <laughs> well I mean I, I really realized that that's where I was supposed to be and I mean, I, it, obviously and leading my first cup race um driving for DK um, knew, knew probably a lot of the potential of the car. Bob Johnson was the crew chief. Um, he's an old name, and um, yep, very good. we did some some trickery. A little um, strategy here. You know, basically oh, trying to get in the, the in the front. Um, Bob, Bob, he was uh, he was um, pretty cocky too, and he knew. He said, "Man, if we get up front, we can lead this race." And and obviously he's DK was second. trying to um, advance his team trying to do, to do as much as he could. And um, I mean, all those things put together and led the race. And we were actually on Hoosier tires. And so Hoosier tires were a lot of times were faster um, some of the time. Yeah. And so so it was interesting. We ended up you know, leading that race and never really realized how, how critical that race would have been. Um, I mean, obviously, if I'd have crashed like early, you know, that would have probably been the end of my a little bit of a career so um i just felt uh and it was pretty awesome to to lead the race and the red Sox um i mean I, I just was was really excited but i was kind of like oh it ain't no big deal we're gonna do this more yeah so that to me was the moment when i think that the rest of the world realized who you were and uh, what you could be and, and not long you're driving for morgan mcclure so you go and drive for uh, for morgan mcclure and it's a winning car, and you won with it. So, talk about that to me. Uh, that to me seemed like such a great fit. Those guys were uh, were cocky. Uh, am, I, am I right? I, I, my perception of them was they were they, they were like, hey man, we're as good as anybody. We can do this. You seem like the perfect driver for them. Well, Tony Glover 
and me got along really well. well. And, um, they they had just hired Phil Parsons, um, and then they ran like two or three races and really One never meshed very no good. <laughs> we have a few. Well, delivers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we have a few. He we have eleven or twelve. Eleven or twelve. Holy moly! Maybe more. I don't remember. That's a tough um, right there. And and then Tony Glover said, he said, hey, called me and said, okay, let's um let's go test you down at Atlanta and see what you can do. I know you can do good. We just need to go down there, run uh, a good test, and be able to, you know, maybe put you in this car a lot. A and so it's we went down there. Goal. It had been raining. A run um, and an so, I mean, I said, okay. So we were sitting there and waiting for it to dry up, dry up. And it finally dried up some, but the old Atlanta speed, um, Speedway would it would leak water all the time as far as in the corners it would drain down. Yeah, and so so it's like Glover's like, man, I got to get you in this car. I got to get you, you know, seeing about getting going. And um, he said, Tony said, I'm telling you, just go out there, do a good job, don't hit nothing. You're, you're going to be this driver. I said, okay, well, here comes the cockiness out of me. So I, just, I decided, so I went out there and warmed up some and then stood on the gas. And basically, Glover, Glover tells me, he said, I ran like a half second faster than the pole was the, the race before. I don't know that for sure, but that's what he told me. Um, and that made me more cocky. Um, and it, it was um, the, the way that uh, maybe I was going through the water and, you know, didn't really care about it because uh, I knew it was going to stick, I hope. Um, and so, so that's when um, uh, Morgan McClure, you know, Larry, um, called me and said, hey, let's, um, let's do this deal. Um, try to try to run you at um, as many races as we can. So they, don't, they didn't run the full ski season back then? Oh no, they ran the full season, yeah. but I um, mean, you know, obviously, um, you know, Larry, Larry, they were always in between a little bit of um, sponsorship stuff, but they had the Kodak program, yeah. um, and so, so Larry said, you know, I think it was more trying to make sure that he it's like, it okay, well, you get out there and do it, and as long as we can do, keep doing good, we're going to keep you in the car. I got to ask you, Arnie. I mean, because you keep bringing up the fact that you were cocky, and I know that that was sort of like the reputation, um, but. Explain to me a little bit more about this cockiness. I mean, is it is it the confident kind of cocky, or did it literally come off as you know, sort of a, a jerk to other people who don't know you? Or did you care about relationships? Was it with your team? Was it with other drivers? Like, who who, who was calling you cocky uh, beyond yourself? One and zero. Um, I mean, I mean, I'm not real sure who was calling me cocky, um, but. Up the middle. I mean, I just, I just knew what I could do um, with the right, the with the right stuff and the right car. Um, I, I knew I had. I mean, I could drive a race car as good as anybody. I felt um, it didn't really matter, but if I had the right stuff under me, I knew I could win races. Um, it was, it was a long, um, drawn-out goal to try to do it, but you know, I mean, I, I felt like. That's kind of what Ball helped set start. me apart from because a lot of people. And, um, when I got in the mall in the first car, it was like, this, this is like easy. And it's a lot thing. easier than you know, DK's car because it was, you know, DK had, didn't have a whole lot of um, funding and um, he didn't have the cars as uh, good as um, the Morgan Fleur team. Yeah, you became a force right away with the, the, the orange number four Morgan McClure Kodak car. And it was a good-looking race car. So you go out there and you're you're you start to have success and you're winning races with those guys and your confidence it's feeding that confidence yeah. feeding that cockiness. The runner at first is going. Is it? It's my perception that the relationship in the between you and the team kind of soured a little bit right before you ended up going to drive uh, for Yates. Is that true? Did you guys end on good terms? Well, I mean, we. Kind of ended on good, good terms. I mean, me and Tony were still friends, and me and Larry still talked. There was no problem there. Um, I, I mean, it was a lot because I wanted to um, do things and, and make the team better.
After and Larry said, and he said, we'll do Red anything Sox we got to do to make the team 12. better. And it just never really happened then. Um, the unfortunate situation with Davey dying um, with a helicopter wreck. Um, and then um, they call me, and it was actually um, Lee Morris called me. Um, and me and my wife were um, Kim. We were, uh, we were in bed that night and um, up at Pocono. And they called me and they said, hey, we were thinking about you driving the, the Texaco car, 28 with Robert Yates. Um, I, would you be interested? And I knew that I had a contract. So I told them, I said, well, I'm under contract with uh, Morgan McClure and Kodak. And so, I mean, I, I just don't know how I can get out of that. Um, and then they, they said, well, if we can get you out of that, would you be interested in driving the car? And I said, most definitely, I would love to drive that car. Yeah. So they just negotiated a buyout? Evidently, they never really told me a whole lot. Um, it just, uh, I mean, I think they may have. Uh, I'm not real sure. But um, next thing I know, um, they told me that I could um, uh, relieve myself of the contract. So I, I did that. and. They're started driving a 28 car. Before all that happened, I think, um, what year was that? What year did you drive that car? For the first uh, 93, so 93, I think. In 1991, second you eight. kind of got the name of Swerving Urban. Was that a name that you liked, didn't like? Did, that, did you mind a nickname like that, or did it bother you? Uh, I mean, I'm not so sure that it bothered me because now, again, the cockiness come out yeah so i really didn't care at least they were talking about me just catches um, the corner for and i think sterling marlin's the one that kind of <laughs> come up kind of come up with the name i think you're right <laughs> yeah did so, you like did you get along with sterling back then yeah we got along all right were there any and, drivers um, were there any drivers that you didn't like or, or just kind of had a hard time being around like i, I, I had a few back to the uh, i think everybody's had a few for that ab I, I really never had, I, mean, this guy hit kite, the uh, I don't know if they be like being around me, but um, I never really had no problems with, Line drive I didn't think anybody, um, maybe I may have roughed a few up, not, Sox, not on purpose, um, may, they may not the have liked Red me Sox at the moment, um, but I mean, you were so involved in, in racing after me, you knew that it's like, I mean, everybody kind of like forgets it after a little bit and you know, they still remember it. They put it in their memory bank um, and just go on. Now is the time to celebrate. Football is back. And DraftKings, the leader in one-day fantasy sports, is putting you in the center of this weekend's action with over $8 million up for grabs across all of their contests. To kick off the season, DraftKings is giving new users a free shot at a million-dollar top prize with your first deposit when you use the code DALE during your sign-up. Get in the action now. Track your lineup now and feel the sweat like never before. Every run, pass, and catch means more with a DraftKings lineup. It's simple. Just pick your lineup, stay under the salary cap, and see how your team stacks up against the competition. Nothing adds to the sweat of watching the game quite like having a shot at a million dollar top prize. DraftKings has paid out billions, billions of dollars to winners since 2012, so they know a thing or two about cold hard cash. Download the DraftKings app now and use the code DALE for a limited time, new users get a shot, a free shot, at $1 million, the top prize, the $1 million top prize, and compete for over $8 million in prizes across all contests. Don't miss this extra special week one bonus. Enter the code DALE to get a free shot at the $1 million top prize with your first deposit. That's code DALE, only at DraftKings. Make it rain. Minimum five dollar deposit required. Eligibility restrictions apply. See DraftKings.com for details. Ooh. At Talladega, you had to apologize uh, to the competitors uh, for some recent events during the drivers' meeting. Um, is that something that you wanted to do yourself? Was that what? How did that 
I remember that happening, and and uh, I felt like you know watching the watching your comments, it was a very genuine, you know, a very genuine. It was emotional. Yeah, emotional sort of uh, reaction that you had. Is that something that you did, took upon yourself to do, to sort of let the guys know, hey man, I you know, I'm out, I'm not out here to create a lot of problems. Well, a lot of the reason that I did it was. Richard Petty and your dad um, both talked to me and they said, Hey, you know, you're not going to, you're not going to be able to continue this um, path. Um, You need, you need to figure out, you know, where you're at and what you're trying to accomplish and realize that, you know, you have to race against these guys, you know, probably for the rest of your career. So you need to, you need to like straighten up. You know, and so that that brought a lot of thoughts to my my mind. And um, and so I finally I just did it all on my own. I, I said I went up to Dick Beatty. You remember him? Oh, yeah. Um, and he was the, the main guy. And I asked Dick, I said, hey, would you mind if I said a few words at the driver's meeting? And, and Dick said, you know, I mean. <laughs> Uh, I mean, none of the really competitors ever stop up and or step up and talk at the driver's meeting. Um, and so he said, well, you know, I'll do some checking and figure it out. And this was still at Talladega and um, driver's meeting was going on. Well, getting ready to go on. And Dick come up to me and he said, uh, yeah, is it, it'll be fine to you know say a few words. And so um, then just a little while later at, in the driver's meeting, um, Dick, uh, well, actually, um, I think it was, uh, I can't remember. I think it was, um, Mike Helton or somebody had said, um, uh, Ernie, Ernie wants to, um, say a few words. And so I walked up, um, you know, again, the cockiness was coming out of me. Um, and I walked up and said, you know, I, I, I've had some problems. I've uh, roughed a few people up. I've had been involved in some wrecks that, I, you know, didn't really need to be involved in and, um, but I, I want to apologize. And I also, you know, want to get your guys, um, to have, I want to have some trust around me and I'm going to try to change. Um, and I'm not exactly sure how it all worded, but, um, but, uh, I, I remember seeing Rusty Wallace's face <laughs> and, <laughs> and it, it was one of them that's like, yeah, right. Uh, sure. Let's oh, just man. let's just let's just see how this happens. Um, and <laughs> you know, so we we went. We were at Talladega, and I started the race, and you know, we finished all right. We didn't have no problems. Um, didn't didn't have any wrecks or cause any wrecks. Um, and so that was the lead to trying to do what your dad had said, and um, and then Richard Petty. Yeah, that it's like trying to earn the trust of everybody in the garage area. And, um, from that moment on, I don't know if I really changed my driving style, but I really didn't get involved in a whole lot of wrecks after that. Um, but I, I was still involved in wrecks. 